Let's stand and take your songbooks 381. This is a song we're going to start off with. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Listen, if you're not saved tonight, He can be your wonderful Savior. He can save you. He's promised to do that. 381, He's a wonderful Savior to me. Rejoice in your salvation tonight. I was lost in sin, but Jesus rescued me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was bound by fear, but Jesus set me free. He's a wonderful Savior to me. For He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a friend so true, so patient and so kind. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Everything I need in Him I always find. He's a wonderful Savior to me. For He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. He's a wonderful Savior to me. He is always near to comfort and to cheer. He's a wonderful Savior to me. He forgives my sin. He dries my every tear. He's a wonderful Savior to me. For He a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Dearer grows the love of Jesus day by day. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Amen. Sweeter is His grace while pressing on my way. He's a wonderful Savior to me. For He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Aren't you glad tonight to be saved? It's good to be saved. The opposite of being saved is lost. Yep. Think about this. Lost and without hope, without God. Yet Jesus died for us. 296 in our songbook, No, Not One. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. The best friend you have in this world is still not as close as Jesus wants to be. You can have a friend in Jesus Christ. 296, great song here. There's not a friend like Jesus. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus, no, not one, no, not one, none else could heal all our souls' diseases, no, not one, no, not one, Jesus knows all about our struggles, He will guide till the day is done, there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus, no, not one, no, friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There's not an hour that he is not near us. No, not one. No, Jesus, no, not one, no, it ever say 
saints sing it. Did ever saint find his friend forsake him? No, not one. No, not one. Nor sinner find that he would not take him. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the holy Jesus. No, not one. No, not. Think about it. Was there a gift like the Savior given? No, not one. No, not one. And will he refuse us a home in heaven? No, not one. No, not one. And Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lonely Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Lord, good to see you back in church tonight. Good to be able to praise the Lord again. Boy, that was good this morning. Good Amen. message. Uh, stirred my heart, challenged me about a lot of different things. And looking forward to tonight, Brother Wright, to be preaching again and just praying that God speaks into our heart. He knows what we need. Let I me mean, believe that. God knows already what we need. We don't know what we need. We think we got it figured out, but God knows. And, well, He can just pour it out on us. He will pull up to the table. He'll feed us. He'll take care of us. And so just tonight, come with a needy heart, open heart. Uh, to receive that. Let's pray for those in our church. We've got several that are out sick and just pray that God raises them up and just watches over them. But good to see each one of you here tonight. And I believe God wants to meet with us here this evening. Let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house. And Lord, we can uh, fellowship with one another. Lord, the so song service time to be able to sing and praise your name. You're worthy, God. And we just want to honor you tonight and lift up your name. And then, Lord, we need preaching tonight. We need to be stirred by the word of God, challenged, convicted, uh, encouraged, rebuked, reproved, whatever needs to take place. And Lord, we come tonight uh, just asking you to do your work in our lives. Use the preacher to speak to our hearts and Lord, help us to have an attentive ear to submit to your word. Lord, thank you for what we heard this morning. And Lord, we pray that again tonight you would get the glory for everything. I do pray for those that are sick, not able to be here. Uh, Lord, some are even traveling. Watch over them. Lord, we're here tonight to, to hear from you. So may you get the honor and glory for everything that's done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated, and the choir is going to sing now at this time. The man on the street, the rich in their palaces, the poor and unlearned, and the men of degree. a soul in need of salvation and they all have to come to Calvary and I am so glad that God saves all sinners I'm thrilled and amazed that he sets them free but the biggest Surprise in redeeming all sinners is that he would say, An old sinner like me, well, was I so bad that I needed forgiveness? And was I so wrong? I had to be in a thief, yet I lived in sin's prison, and I was as lost as a sinner could be, and I am so glad God saves all sinners, I'm thrilled and amazed that he sets them free. Surprise! 
you, choir, for that. Stand, take your songbooks with me again. 195, glory to his name. If you're a sinner saved by grace, uh, then you ought to praise God. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. 195. All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave his son for men to die that he might men redeem. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. All right, just a second, just a second. Page 5, 538, 538, 195. 195 All right, yeah, 195. sorry about that. 195, glory to his name. 195, glory to his name. Page 195, glory to his name. This is a familiar one to all of us. Down at that cross where my Savior died. Glory to his name. Sing it out. Here we go. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where from cleansing the sea I The blind. Glory to his name. And glory to his name. And glory to his name. And there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name on the third sing it oh precious fountain that saves from sin i am so glad i have entered in and there jesus saves me and keeps me clean glory to his name glory to his name glory to his name there to my heart was the blood applied Glory to his name, and come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet, and plunge in today and be made complete. And glory to his name, sing it church, and glory to his name, glory to his name, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. All right, now 538. Blessed be the name. Well, that's a good song. They're all good, amen? And I've got that other songbook memorized, man. I can know the song number and tell you what song it was, and I'm still learning on these here. It's a good one. Blessed be the name 538. All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme. Let's keep praising the Lord tonight. 538. Praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave his son for men to die that he might men redeem. And blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. At God the Father's own right hand, where angels host the door. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Redeemer, Savior, friend of man, once ruined by the fall. Thou hast devised salvation's plan, for thou hast died for all. And blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name shall be the Counselor, the mighty Prince of Peace, of all earth's kingdoms conqueror, whose reign shall never cease. And blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Good singing tonight. You may be seated. 
And I appreciate you singing out and getting to break in those new song books and look through there, singing out those songs. And boy, it's, the song service is not just a filler Amen. on our service. This is where we get to worship God, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It encourages us to hear those songs. You might be a blessing to somebody else as you sing out. And what a blessing that is. What a blessing it was this morning to hear Brother Wright's preach. Pastors in Durango, Colorado, the Frontier Baptist Church, been there for over 30 years now, uh, faithfully serving the Lord. And I appreciated him preaching this morning, just a lot of uh, Bible truths. I mean, just uh, you can tell the man walks with God and knows his Bible, and I appreciate that. I think we're in for a treat again tonight. Let's be uh, uh, alert and paying attention. Let God speak to our heart in that. Right before Brother Wright comes, my wife's going to come and sing. And then, Brother Wright, you come and preach for us tonight. And uh, let God use you tonight. Amen. Thank you. Take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Luke, if you would, here tonight. I'm going to turn to that passage as the main passage. And then I'm going to have you also find John 11 and 12, which really kind of continues the story. Uh, but I do want to thank the church here for even letting us come down. I love this church. Uh, I mention this church a whole lot, just what you stand for. Uh, I like one thing. I like how you do everything top notch. Man, this is beautiful. I said that this morning. And I always take notes and... Uh, just even on the sound system and your lighting system. And I know that I don't take that for granted even over our, our men and even you ladies. You'll work tomorrow. I guess tomorrow's off for a lot of people. But it's your tithes and offerings. That's by the sweat of your brow. And I know your preacher feels the same way. I thank you for it. It's a good testimony. Your, this church has a great testimony. God's blessing you. Uh, you've got a great mix, of course, uh, older and younger and kids. I like seeing these guys up on the front row. This is fantastic. Uh, they expect the preacher to knock on their door, but when you got a young man that's excited about the things of God, yeah. people will set up and pay attention. The devil sets up and barks, but we don't care about that. Uh, I'm just telling you, you've got a good thing going. God's been blessing you, and I believe your best days are yet ahead. I really do. And I thank you for it. Thank you for a beautiful hotel. We had great fellowship with your preacher last night. My wife and I are on kind of a keto kick, and uh, 
And uh, so we had uh, just, we're doing the steak and fish and protein stuff. And uh, it's working, it's working all right. I think it was here I heard one preacher say that he had so much weight that his wife put him on, remember that? He said he had two diets and he could barely eat the food of one, let alone both of them. He said he just couldn't hardly keep up with both of them, eating all that food. I think he had it wrong. Uh, but I want you to look here tonight at Luke chapter 10. Uh, it's, this is probably, I'm going to call it, just to title it, Choosing the Good Part. And uh, just kind of as a side, I think it's a sign for us today I do believe that we're heading into the last days. I, I think we're, uh, again, Jesus said, when you see these things come to pass, know uh, that it's near, even at the doors. Now, we're not, we're not going to see all the signs. John R. Rice used to preach the rapture. There are no signs for the rapture, and I believe that. All the signs are for the revelation. That's because it's for the Jews. And the church is always mysteriously absent in that amazing thing in the tribulation. I wonder why. Uh, but... Uh, you know, uh, again, we can see a lot of things happening. Man, didn't, didn't, it, didn't people submit pretty quick on the, the vaccination? And I'm not judging you whether you got it or not. I'm just saying, man, you can see how people stand in line. And, I mean, they're saying, hey, there's even the, the governor of, of Utah said today uh, that the unvaxxed ought to be put in prison. And so I'm just saying, and we're headed somewhere. And the, devil, the devil's got a goal in mind. I'll leave all that junk to your preacher on uh, what he wants to say or not say. But I want to tell you this, you and I can live successfully for the Lord in these last days. I really believe it. If Noah walked with God, and Enoch walked with God, and it was so bad that the thoughts of man's heart were evil continually, guess what? God believes you and I can walk with God in these last days. And I don't want to just survive the last days. I would like to succeed. I don't want our church just to survive. Your church isn't surviving. Your church is succeeding. So many churches today are literally, they're dying. They have no young people. I have no young adults. There's a lot of young adults here tonight. And you're, I, want to su- I want to succeed, not just survive. I want to overcome, not be overwhelmed by sin. And so I want you tonight to look at this passage, very famous passage, in Luke chapter 10. I'll read the verses there at verse 38. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman. Now I want to just stop. I like things come to my mind. I'll say what I can. A cert- this really happened. It says a certain village. And a certain woman. This really happened. This isn't a parable. Look back at uh, verse number 31. uh, Or verse 30. A certain man went down from Jerusalem. That really happened. The Good Samaritan is a real story. Verse number 31. A certain priest came that way. Passed that way. Verse 33. A certain Samaritan. Look at verse 25. Behold a certain lawyer. You know that reminds me in Luke 16 when there was a certain rich man. That really happened. There was really a rich man that that story happened to. And there was a, he, fer, he was clothed in purple and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar laid at his feet. This is a real story. And what this story is about is the closest thing that Jesus had as a family. Man, I'm telling you, he had it rough when he was here. He was the only person ever born to die. You were never born to die. You were born to live with God forever. You were born to get saved, if you would, and have eternal life. And Jesus said, he that believeth in me shall never die. And, he would, and he, it's going to come up in this, this account, this connection here. What he's talking about is eternity. You are born to live forever if you'll trust Christ as Savior. But Jesus was born to die. He said, for this hour am I come. He was born to die, take our sins, and suffer hell. I mean, when he died on the cross prophetically, you remember in Psalms it says, David said of him, he spake of his, his soul was not left in hell. Thou will not leave my soul, listen to this, in the lowest hell. I think Jesus went deeper into the sufferings of the wrath and judgment of God than any human ever will. That will not leave my soul where? In the lowest hell. I think he would go farther down. I personally would say probably he's even going to, probably suffer the wrath of God maybe more than the devil himself. He was in the lowest hell, but he said, I'm going to get out by faith. He said, I looked for some to give me pity. He said, I looked on my right hand and found none. I looked on my left hand. No man cared for my soul. You'll never say that, especially if you're saved. Because Jesus said, I'll never leave thee, forsake thee. There really are five negatives in there. I was reading into to my wife today. There are five negatives in there. I'll never, not a chance in the world, no, ever, never, ever, ever leave thee nor forsake thee. That's, what he, that's in Hebrews. It's, there, there's five negatives in there. We used to have double negatives, and my mom would say, uh, your, man, your socks are dirty. Sunday night, your socks are dirty. Get, I ain't got no clean socks. Yeah, that's a double negative. That means you got clean socks. But that's not how the Jews did it. When they doubled up, verily, verily, 
I say, that means listen, listen. And Jesus said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. He looked for some to bring me salvation. He said, I found none, therefore mine own. Jesus was facing, getting ready in a few days to face Calvary, face the devil, face suffering our hell on Calvary's cross. I don't believe he went to hell for three days like Benny Hinn says. The Bible says who bore our sins in his body on the tree. See, the worst part of hell is not the burning. It's not the plagues. It's not the company you keep. The worst part of hell is when God says to a last man, lost man, leave, depart from me. The presence of God. When that person is cast into hell and those gates of hell swing shut, those bars, that door, and those hinges will rush throughout all eternity. They'll never swing again. They'll never swing again. It'd be like the Sodomites in the city of Lot, uh, 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 Sodom chasing Lot. When they were struck with blindness, it said they wearied themselves to find the door. Now that's somebody really possessed of wickedness. They've been struck blind and they're still trying to find that door to get to Lot and to get to those angels. That's that, I think that's where we're headed. I had a preacher ask me the other day, do you think people are possessed today? I said, I think more people are possessed today than they've ever been. I just think people, I think the devil's covered a lot with drugs, but everybody and their dogs taking drugs, and I think the devil one of these days, hey, isn't it interesting when Jesus showed up, the devils come out of the woodwork? You know why? Because they knew. They said, we know who thou art. They knew the time. They said, you coming before the time to punish us? And the Bible says in the last days, when the devil's kicked out, even God warns the earth, says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath. For he knoweth he hath but a short time. Hey, there's demons that are listening to me tonight. They're interested in what I'm saying. You may not be, but I'm telling you what, the devil is. And what he's looking at is how are you going to survive these last days? Is there anybody here that Jesus warned in the last days, when I come, will, there find, will I find faith on the earth? Now, folks, that's a warning. Amen. He's saying something. That's a challenge. That's a warning. When I come back, will I find faith on the earth? How do we get faith? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by what? The Bible says, that's why I'm glad this church, your preacher said today that you had to tell the light guys to paint the churches black and shut everything down and nobody brings a Bible and the preacher doesn't even bring a Bible. He said, no, we're independent Baptists. I love that title. I like that. I do a workout from the church at times, do construction. And I love it when they say, well, you're a Baptist preacher. That just says it all, don't it? I don't have to sit there, oh, a Baptist. I don't have to sit there and argue. You know, they know exactly what we are if you're really an independent Baptist. And your preacher said, no, we need lights because our people read the Bible. And I'm glad this church does that. I mean, we got churches today where the preacher's not even using a Bible. Isn't that nuts? That's absolutely insane. Verse 38, now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which sat, also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care? What a, what a statement. That my sister hath left me to serve alone. Bitter, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Now I want you to look at that verse number 42 again. That's what I'm going to talk about, that good part. It says, Martha, Martha, you, you're really a mess. Uh, they're facing troublous times. You're, you're troubled. The word is torbidzo, where we get uh, disturbed or uh, to uh, a, 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 uh, something turbulence. So that's where we get our English word. And he said, you're, you're, in, you're in a lot of trouble, you think. But Mary had chose something different. She's made a different choice in your life. I'm glad for a lot of choices I've made in my life. You know, I never decided. I told our church that I've never pursued finances. I've turned my back several times on different situations. I could have... Uh, excelled quite a bit in finances, and I've, I've never pursued finances. And God's always provided for us. Amen. He's always provided, built us a beautiful, kind of a log lap sided house. The church gave us some land, and we sold that and bought a little ranch. And now my son's the associate in Durango, so expensive. Of course, the, you heard me say that, that we were given a building that was worth $2 million leveled uh, 15 years ago, and a parsonage is the, is estimated at half a million dollars. And uh, just God's been good to us, and I'm not bragging on that at all. I'm just saying, I know I'm going to worry about it. Oh, you're, you're going to face some troublous times in these last days. Jesus and these ladies are heading into some troubled times. And these people are going to have their faith, their, er, their world of their world belief and their religious belief, what they believe about Christ, is going to be turned upside down, but not Mary's. They chose the good part. Amen. And I want you to think about that. What in the world is the good part? 
What did Martha do that was wrong? You know, Martha gets a bad rap, doesn't she? And, I, and I, I've given her a bad rap. You know, she's, uh, she's serving all the time. And, uh, well, that's a good thing, but we, you know, preachers say, well, she's bad. You know, she's serving, and Jesus is in there preaching, time to preach. But, you know, can you, uh, you know, we, we tag people. You, you, uh, da- uh, Thomas, if I said Thomas, what do you think of? Dowdy. I mean, we tag him. Wouldn't you hate to be tagged for one of your mistakes? <laughs> Boy, I hope not. You made a mess, and then the rest of your life, nobody ever lets you forget it. Doubting Thomas. Yeah, there you go. And Martha, she kind of gets a bad rap. And uh, it's not that she had chosen a carnal thing, a wicked thing. She just didn't choose the best thing. She could have chosen a, a better thing. And it says there that, of course, Jesus went to the, her house. She was a rich lady. Notice what it says there in verse number 38 that Martha received him in her house. You know, to choose the right thing, to choose the good thing. I said a couple times to my wife here recently, I said, you know, I think we've made the right choice in some of the things in our life. Uh, again, I've made a lot of bad choices. Join the party. Uh, join the human race. Well, I just messed my life up. Well, who hasn't? But, you know, uh, the, the good choices we look back in our life, say, man, I'm really glad we made that choice. I'm glad we decided to raise our kids that way. And, and they're not perfect, but I'm thanking God they're all in church. And I'm not bragging on that because we're none of us are out of the woods yet. I know that. But I'm sure glad they're all in good Baptist churches. And they're raising all my grandkids to, to believe the Bible and to, and to hear good preaching. I'm so thankful for that. That sure beats uh, with some of our relatives. Maybe a daughter, uh, my, one of my nieces, uh, committed suicide. Another, uh, uh, one of my nephews, he gassed himself to death, committed suicide. And just... Man, I tell you, you can look at your own family and you can just, you got probably all kinds of troublous things that your family's gone through. But you look at some of the choices, man, that's the right choice. So what, what was it that Martha did? Well, they both made a choice. And you're making a choice right now whether you believe it or not. So, well, I'm not choosing. Hey, that's a choice. <laughs> if you're here tonight and you're not saved and said, I'm not going to get saved, that is a choice. That's a deci- no decision is a decision. And I want you to look there at verse number 42. First of all, I know Mary made a choice. Mary had chosen the good part. She made a choice. But if you look there at verse number 38, Martha made a choice. It says Martha received him into her house. Now, that's a good choice, inviting Jesus over. I'm glad that my preacher that I've told you about, literally born 1899, August 25th, I think it was, 1899, the preacher I grew up under, and I'm glad my mom told him, if you ever are not invited over on a Sunday, you always have an open invitation to our house. Now, he came to my little country church at 75. I've told you about it. Most of you, he retired five times and, and he'd come down to our little church. And thank God for it. He's the most godly man I ever met. Rescued me. I'm thankful for it. And I'm glad my mom and dad stayed with the preacher. I'm glad they didn't leave. And um, that preacher was the last two churches that he pastored. He got up in years to his 92nd year. And the last two churches he pastored kicked him off, kicked him out. And what a pack of fools. Both of those churches were packed out. We were in a little country church, I said 15 miles from a town of 250, and we'd have, we'd have youth activities and have 25, 30 teenagers out in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Nebraska. Why in the world would you support a preacher like that? He was at, went to another church and and took a church that was an absolute mess, and I'd go to Bible college and preach here, and I didn't realize all the mess that was going on in the church. And before it was done, that building was packed. And he had kids everywhere, and he loved children. He'd say, let the children cry. And I'd think, no, get the kids out. I can't even hear you. But he loved children. And that church ended up running him off. And both of those churches today have Ichabod written on them. One is, uh, they're both houses, and one is uh, the, the people that live in it are convicted pedophiles. Well, the church I grew up in, folks, I'm just telling you, we're going to face some troublous times in these last days. Jesus said in the world, you shall have tribulation. Yeah. Now, she did the right thing. She invited Jesus in. I look at that and say, hey, would Jesus be welcome in your house tonight? Would you welcome, Would you feel comfortable? You know, sometimes you have the preacher over, and, you know, we have the stories. When I was in Illinois, I did my, one of my, the treasurer, the guy who, Ended up being my treasurer. Before he got saved, he told me, he's the guy that say, the preacher's here, knock on the door, hide the beer. You know, he always got those kind of stories. Then he got saved, became my treasurer. Sometimes it's uncomfortable to have the preacher around, but why should that be? That shouldn't be. 
Man, I, I used to look at that elderly preacher in his 70s, and I was a teenager. Actually, I was 12 years old when he first came, and I'd watch him. I'd sit in the back, and I was backslidden, and I wasn't con- con- one bit concerned about God, and I got involved in drugs. I had, I had long hair down to my shoulders, and it was blonde. Can you believe that? Hey, I grew up in the 70s. Give me a break. That was my teen years in the 70s, hippies and all of that. I wouldn't tell you how I'd dress him too embarrassed. But I'd watch that old guy, and I'd think, that guy's real. That guy is real. He invited him to our house, and I think that guy's real. My dad always invited missionaries. We used to have, I won't tell you the organization because they're getting way off, but my sister was, and uh, two nephews, they, and her husband, they became jungle missionaries. And uh, a lot of our pastors were jungle, uh, jungle preachers. I mean, they literally, some were bush pilots. They'd land out in the field. One of the preachers forgot his Bible one time, so he went and circled back around the house yelling at his wife, bring my Bible, bring my Bible. That's how I grew up with missions. And my dad would always invite the missionaries over. And I'm so glad he did. Because I'd listen to those kids tell about stories, I say, of swimming the Amazon, getting bit by alligators and piranhas. I think, man, serving God is the coolest thing in the world. I want to be a missionary. Now, she did that. That was a choice. And the next choice she made, look at it in verse number 239. It says, uh, she received in her house. She had a sister called Mary, which sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving. That's not a bad thing. What's so wrong about that? I thought we we're supposed to serve. Didn't Jesus say the chiefest among you shall be servant of all? Right. And he said that. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, ver- that's a very critical thing. We ought to want to uh, serve. So what was she doing that was so wrong? People say, well, she was multitasking. She, her, she was troubled about many things. Multitasking. They say you ladies can multitask better than us guys. But I read there's a, there a thing, uh, the study they did said, really, you're not but you're just more patient. Now, boy, I'd agree with that. You ladies are so patient. I will, I, you know, my grandkids there, or my kids will say, do you want to hold the baby? No, I'm fine just looking at them. I, I'm not trying to be mean. I, that's the, kind of the area my dad was. That's kind of, I just enjoy watching them. And, but, and, but you ladies know what to do. And those babies will cry, and I watch my wife, and even uh, my one daughter-in-law that doesn't even have kids that just married my youngest son, I just watch them, and they, they pick the baby up, and they start bouncing them like that and patting their bottom, and, the baby quiets up and think, oh, man, if it was up to us, guys, nobody would live. Nobody would survive. And you ladies are more patient. That's not why he, that wasn't the problem. And the problem wasn't that she was serving. Actually, serving is a pretty good thing. In fact, Jesus uh, admonished him. He said, look, the Son of Man didn't come to this earth to be ministered to. That word minister is diaconist, it means serve. Uh, he said he didn't come to be served, but to minister, to serve. And to give his life a rest for many. What, what was it was so bad that with these many things, it wasn't that she was doing many things. Uh, she was serving. That was her choice. But it wasn't the best choice. I do know that. And he said, you've not made the right choice. Now, Mary has. She's chosen the, the good part. First thing I want you to see is the choosing they both had. And then I want you to see where if you make the right choice, a good thing. But if you make the wrong choice, the confusing that Mary or Martha had in her life. I want you to see the confusion. Look at verse number 40. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bitter, therefore, that she help me. I always like those. I like words. I hated them in school. I love history and I love linguistics. Cumbered means to drag all around. Just drag. You're just dragging a dragging baggage. You know, what I ought to do is get one of these boys up here and have him lay down on the floor and have Daniel come back up and try to lead singing while he's dragging one of these boys around. You know, dragging him around. That's what I mean, just dragging. Man, she's cumbered about. Yeah. Just dragging. A, you know, when she, the Bible says reckon you yourself. It's, that's what some people do with their past. Just dragging around a dead body. Can you imagine, hey, okay, it's time to go to the bus route. Here we go. Then you're dragging one of these boys around. You get on the bus and clunk, clunk, clunk up the stairs you go and Try to say, man, it'd be a mess. You're, if you try to live your life like that, Jesus said, you're, she, the Bible said she's just cumbered about. She just, her life's a mess. She's worrying. She's fretting. Just dra- it means to drag a, a, all around with much serving. Say, so, well, then that's the problem. No, it's not the problem. He said, look what it says there in verse 41. Jesus said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. The problem wasn't that she was serving. You know, uh, I have a brother that's with the Lord now, and he was Pentecostal up in Denver, and 
They said, oh, you Baptists, you're Martha and we're Mary. You know, you Baptists, you serve, 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 and we sit at Jesus' feet. And what he meant, you know, he said, well, the Bible says occupy. That, that doesn't mean take up space. That doesn't mean breathe the air around you. But that's how he interpreted it. Occupy. <laughs> Sitting around till Jesus comes. Just, I'm occupying the space. That's not what occupy means. Right. Remember he said to thou wicked and slothful servant. Yep. Yep. What did that servant do? Nothing. Right. Did he go rob a bank? No. Did he commit adultery? No. What did he do? Nothing. And Jesus said, you wicked and slothful servant. At the very least, you should have put your talents in the bank and I got mine own with usury. Man, God's looking for us. He is looking for people to serve. It's not just you serving. It's not just you trying to do too much for the Lord, multitasking. The problem was she didn't have the right view about it. He said, you are careful and troubled about many things, and it caused her to be distracted. Man, her attitude got kind of bad. She, had, she went from choosing the wrong thing to being confused about what's going on to criticizing. Look at verse 40 again. It says in verse number 40, Martha was coming out serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister had served me alone? Bid her. Wait, I thought Jesus was God here. I thought he was the Lord. How come she's telling Jesus what to do? My son, pre oldest son preached a sermon. I stole it from him. Uh, Lord, no. What an oxymoron. I think that's the right word. If it's not, you can correct me later. What a, I think maybe a misnomer, I think is a better word. What a weird thing. God, no, Almighty, no. To saying, Almighty God, no. You know how many people did that in the Bible? You know, the angel of the Lord tells Lot, you better book it out of this city, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Lot almost died for sodomy. So I didn't know he was a sodomite. He wasn't, but he was deking around holding hands with them. And the angel said, get out lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. God said, I'm burning it and everything in it's going up. You know what that tells me? That tells me what you, do, you and I don't do anything about your part of. Man, I, I, there's, I, I'm... I, I, I've earned, I told our people, I'm probably going to be a mean old preacher. I've been nice all these years, and I've earned it. I'm going to probably, I'm sick and tired of people, just, uh, the news and people faking things and fibbing about things and, and not taking God serious. I'm tired of it. And I think God's getting tired of it too. I, I really do. It's time we get serious about serving God in these last days. And it means that we're going to have to pay a price. And he said that God told Lot, get out. And he said, flee out of the city. Don't look back. Flee to the mountain. And you know what Lot said? Oh, not so, Lord. Lord. <laughs> God, no. Not going to do it. There's a little city down here. Is it not a little one? <laughs> that's how we are today. Well, I know the preacher said we ought to do this, but that's pretty extreme. No, God. No, Lord. I'm not going to do it. He says to Peter, rise, kill, and eat. He says, oh, not so, Lord. Uh, man, I'm not going to do that. Uh, these lips have never touched anything unclean. No, Lord. I mean, you know who else does that? Rich man in hell. Rich man in hell was told by Abraham, hey, he said, listen, if somebody had rise from the dead, isn't it interesting in that story? We say that, you know, he said, if someone rise from the dead, well, you know who did? Lazarus did rise from the dead. Did that convince people? Well, that's in John 11. We're going to look at in just a minute here. And, they, and Abraham said, no, that's not, that, that we're not going to do that. And he's, he's barking orders, and he said, they have Moses and the prophets. And you know what he said? He said, nay, in hell, he's not one bit repentant. You know, people talk about pur purgatory, purgatory. That's what the word purgatory means. Is insinuating. You say, What's, where's that in the Bible? Nowhere. Yeah, right. Fire doesn't cleanse a lost person of sin. Yeah, right. It sanctifies a saved person like Isaiah, but the devil always takes verses on service and mixes them up with salvation. Yeah. What can wash away my sin? Yeah. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And here uh, the rich man in hell is, and he said, hey, the Bible's what God has laid out. And he said, no. You know what he's saying? I don't, I'm still not submitting. You know, the, the uh, false prophet and the Antichrist, they're cast in the lake of fire, and at the end of the 
uh, the uh, millennium, Satan's cast in the lake of fire where the beast and false prophet are. They're still there. And uh, when the devil gets out of the bottomless pit at the beginning, he's still as wicked as ever. Fire doesn't change a person at, at all. I just, people are rebellious. And you see Martha here. Look at this. Martha is, you know this about Martha? Every time Martha speaks, she's correcting Jesus. Now, you may think that's odd, but your preacher could name names. He could name names. Uh, went through the gifts. And see, uh, uh, there are seven gifts, I believe, for Roman, uh, Roman 12, I believe, those service gifts. And the problem is, is what, when, you, when Martha doesn't choose the good part, you start criticizing. You start criticizing everybody. You're like the guy that ate Limburger cheese sandwich and he had Limburger on his mustache, wakes up in the morning and said, the whole world stinks. Pretty soon, every, nobody can do right. God doesn't even do right. You're, you're, she's, she's rebukes Jesus here. Then later on, she says, Jesus, listen to this. And we'll look at it in a minute. If you'd have been here and my brother had not died. You see, hear that in her voice? Jesus, you made a mistake. I trusted you. You should have been here. If you'd have, if you'd have been here on time, this wouldn't have happened. Now you've blown it. Now it's too late. My brother's dead. And he says, take the stone away. Oh, no, Lord. Don't you do that. By now he stinketh. <laughs> no, Jesus. She's, this, do, do Christians do that? All the time. Somebody who has a gift of giving will look around and somebody else says, why don't they give more? Why do they give? Nobody else. I give and nobody else gives. Somebody with mercy says, man, I am so kind to people. I, we ought to be, uh, give them Christmas baskets and nobody else in the church cares. And ladies who are servants, and God bless you ladies. I think ladies naturally have that. But I always tell people in our church, I say, look, you ladies, now I, I do this. I probably shouldn't do that. I had a teacher in school said, whenever, oh, I shouldn't probably say this. I got to look around here real quick. I don't think so. He said, man, when you see ladies with a chain on their neck, on their glasses, look out for them. Now, I don't, don't see any of you ladies like that. But here's what I do tell my people. If you ladies are bossy, we're going to have problems down the line. Because you ladies that want to serve, you get in the kitchen and it's your domain. Especially if that's your gift. Don't, don't you touch my, don't you touch that silverware. I put it like it needs to be. We've been working on that for the last 10 years. I'm just telling you, when you make the wrong choice, you'll start criticizing everybody and you might even start criticizing Jesus. Uh, you know, I like the verse says, the hungry uh, the, the, how's it goes? The hungry soul loatheth the honeycomb. Or, uh, the hungry soul, uh, the full soul, excuse me. The full soul loatheth the honeycomb. But to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. I like that. Every time I read that verse, I think of baloney, because I hate baloney. <laughs> but when I'm really hungry, I, it don't sound too bad. I don't like hot dogs either. But when you're hungry, the hungry soul... Every bitter thing is sweet. Man, when you're full, man, you, you do it all the time. We come out, I, I grew up with five kids, and we'd preach, and we used to sing here once in a while. Somebody brought that up today, and we'd stay at Comfort Inn for 25 bucks, and I'd tell five kids, okay, this is your breakfast, and this is your lunch. You better eat up. And we'd get our 25 bucks, and then some. And so, but you go to those all eat, eat and buffet, and I always overdo it. And we just did it. Uh, well, last week up in Grand Junction. And you come out and think, oh, man, that don't sound good at all. Chinese buffet. Boom. You know why? Because you're full. And you know why you and I don't have peace in our life as a Christian? Because we're full. God's, again, I said it today, folks. We are blessed. You're going to go out. We have bifocals. You're going to go out in your car. You're going to get the lumbar support just right. And if you like, your, like my wife, you're going to turn that seat heat on, which I hate. And you're going to get the temperature set just right. And the lights are just perfect in here. And you're on nice, soft pews. Everything. And you're going to go home and pop open the fridge and maybe pop something in the microwave. And because of that, the hungry soul, the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. You know, a lot of times I look at the news. And I just sent a headline to all of my kids. And I said, do not, do not. I sent them a terrible newscast. I said to my wife, I said, I'm going to take a picture of this. I'm going to send it to all five of my kids. You watch your children. And I send it to them. And whenever I see a story like that, I think, and I do, I'll sometimes just say, thank you, Jesus. 
Man, isn't God good to us? You got legs tonight. I think everybody in here walked in here on their own tonight. I think so. You can see probably. I don't think anybody in here is blind tonight. You probably got a full belly. It probably is. Probably is you got too full of a belly. Our problem is we're so blessed we have to pay farmers not to raise food. I grew up in, the, in a ranching area. Paying farmers not to plant crops. Paying farmers to kill the pigs because there's too many and they're ruining the market. Paying dairy farmers to dump, dump milk on the ground because there's too much milk. And it's, that's what we are in America. We're blessed. And so here, that's Martha is. She's got a house. Rich woman. She received him, the Bible says, into her house. And notice her criticizing. She came to him. That word came to me means to place over, to place upon, to stand over one. Now, you see, you know, I think Jesus a lot of times was seated there, and Martha is in the other room. And I, I, I like acting this out because she's, oh, she's, see, the Bible says, she said, Mary hath left me. See, Mary had been in the kitchen. I think they both had been serving. I think they both had been sitting. Because it says she received into her house, and Mary also sat at Jesus' feet. I think they were all sitting around. And, you know, sometimes, again, this is in the city of Bethany. It's two miles on the south of the Mount of Olives. It's, an, it's a little city still there today. It's where all the poor people live. It's where the Galileans lived. And remember, they wouldn't cut through right straight north of Jerusalem. They would go, they must, Jesus said it must needs go through Samaria. Usually they would go from Galilee. See, Galileans, they were the hillbillies. Behold, are not all these that speak Galileans? How learn, how'd, this, how'd they learn letters? How'd these guys learn how to talk straight? These guys are Galileans. They got y'alls in there. And they would cut across there on the north by uh, the Sea of Galilee, come down on the far Jordanian side. They'd come to Jericho, and they'd come up the ascent of Adam, the Aduma Way, the Red Way. And they'd come up there, and right before Jerusalem, they'd hit Pooresville. And that's where the poor people lived. And I was really surprised the first time I went there, and uh, we, it's still where the poor people live. I'm not trying to be mean, but it was where the non-Jews lived, I'll put it that way. And the whole place, it, it was, there was trash and garbage everywhere. And it really smelled. And I thought, but there's still poor people here in Bethany. But you know, Jesus liked to stop there often. It was, just, it was just a boy and his two sisters. I suspicion Martha was the big sister. She seems bossy, yeah, you know. I, and it was her house. I suspicion Lazarus was the, he was the youngster probably. You know, I was the youngest of ten, or ten, nine kids, but I was the youngest of six boys. So I was always stupid. I'm I, if they're, most of them are gone. If they were alive and could speak, they'd probably still say I'm st the stupid. I'm the dumb. I'm the little, the little brother, you know. I suppose that's what they thought of Lazarus. And Martha, it's her house. And pretty soon she starts looking at this. Well, man, this preacher is preaching long here. He, what happened here? It's 12.010, and there's no McDonald's around here. Mary, come on, help me. Go in the kitchen. They go in the kitchen. They start getting, man, there's no McDonald's. They start working around the kitchen. And I always say, I don't know how it happened, but somehow Mary slipped out. <laughs> it's time for preaching. Maybe she's trying to listen a little bit like you ladies in the nursery. And she heard the thing. And she slipped back in there and sat at his feet. And I can see Martha looking at well, Mary. Mary, where'd Mary go? She looks out. Well, that no good lazy sister of mine. And that bugged her. I can see her in there in the kitchen. And I always say like you ladies, you know, you a little bit mad, and you take that silverware and you throw it in the door, just a little clang, dishes clang, bang. She starts doing that, and nobody, she looks out, and nobody, Jesus just going right on. He's not saying in conclusion. And pretty soon she looks out and just huffing and a puffing, and pretty soon she stomps out there and stands over Jesus and said, Jesus, Lord, would you command my sister and tell her to get back in here? And Jesus said, no, I won't. He said, I'm not going to do it. But first off, I like how he said, he said, Martha, Martha. Man, when God calls your name twice, you're in trouble. You better listen. Simon, Simon. That's how he did it. Simon, son of Jonas, Satan had desired to have thee. Abraham, Abraham. Man, when God calls your name twice, Martha, Martha, you are a nervous wreck, aren't you? Thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is, is needful. He rebukes her. I don't think she changed. We'll see that in a minute. 
That's the next thing. She starts complaining to Jesus. Look at verse 40. It says, She was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? She left me to serve alone. That word alone is moron or moros. Where we get the idea, solo, single, monotonous, monotone. Johnny, uh, she's a Johnny one note. Uh, look over, keep your hand here, but look over at John chapter, John chapter 12. I mean, this lady, she was a servant. Again, again, thank God for you ladies. I'm not, I'm not saying we don't need servants and ladies to serve. We sure do. But, man, you can cause more trouble sometimes than the devil. You, you, can, you can cause a, a, a hornet's nest in a church when you get out of, out of shape. Look what it says there in John 11. It says, And Jesus, said, six, uh, Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. Same town. Different home, but same people. Where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead, where they made him a supper. Now, the other Gospels will tell you, it says it was in the house of Simon the leper. And that's important to see. Because later on, it said Judas, Simon's son. Which a lot of pea preachers believe, and I believe it was in his house. And I think his dad had been healed of leprosy. And Jesus embarrassed him, and it really burned, it just burned Judas all to pieces. Because Mark says right after this happened... With Mary coming in. See, both of these ladies are here. It says they made, look at verse 2. And they made him a supper. Look at Martha served. So she takes over the kitchen into somebody else's house. She goes in there and said, all right, I, I'm the lady here. I'm in charge. And all you ladies, I said, get organized here. Now, let's, sister so-and-so, I want you doing this. It's not even her house. She's serving. And it says, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table and then took Mary. All three of them are right here again. You see in this story, and I want to back up, look back at Luke 11 again, or Luke, uh, Luke 10. I want you to back up. We'll come back to that just in a minute. But I want you to see the choosing, the confusing, the criticizing, the complaining, and even the commanding. She starts telling Jesus what to do. She says, you, Jesus, tell my sister to get up and get back in there. She tells Jesus that's what he needs to do. She starts commanding Jesus and telling him what to do. I uh, bid her that she said that she helped me, that she assist me. And boy, we can get to that. She kind of lost perspective. She thought what she was doing was more important than what Jesus was doing. And folks, you say, well, how would she have known? Well, how did Mary know? Mary, I believe, was the only person that got it. I got a list here. I'll see if I can find it here. I got six times where Jesus flat out told the disciples, hey, I'm going to the city of Jerusalem. I'm going to be tried. They're going to try me. and They're going to, uh, they're going to kill me. They're going to crucify me. And in three days, I'm going to rise again. And all six times, they said, wait, what did he say? They didn't even catch it. She caught it. As far as I know, she's the only person in all the multitude that actually heard it. Look what it says. Look over at Mark chapter 11 real quick. Where that story is. Look at Mark chapter 11. Actually, Mark 14. Mark 14, verse number 3. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, very precious. Now, that's what you're looking at in John 12. And she broke the box and poured it on his head, and there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for three. Now, the other gospels would tell you it was Judas that said it. He led the murmuring. Remember Brother Dawson? Murmur. Remember that? He said, nothing doesn't sound good. Murmur. Do all things without murmuring and disputing. And Judas said, I don't think that was right. Jesus shouldn't have done that. Peter, what do you think? Well, I don't think it was probably too good either. Yeah, it wasn't good because there's some poor people out there. That was 300 pence. We could have helped a lot of poor people. Preacher shouldn't have done that. Well, you know what, Judas, you're right. Andrew, what do you think? And they started a little murmur session going. You know what, Jesus? He's going, he's going to face Calvary. The, Martha comes in and said, do you not care about me? I mean, talk about the audacity. They're in a boat, the disciples. The boat's going down. Jesus is asleep. And they're saying, Lord, carest thou not that we perish? Save us. Well, think about it. Why is Jesus asleep in a storm? The Bible says water is coming. Man, he was exhausted. He'd been helping so many people. He was sleeping through a storm. 
Man, you, you may not realize that preaching drains you. It drains you. I know how to work, okay? I grew up with six brothers. Again, my dad was raised through the Depression. He worked the dog out of us. And uh, again, we always had a sick pig and sheep and, and your thistles to cut and fence to fix and cows to sort and horses to break. And when I graduated from high school, I come home and there wasn't a single chore on the place. He didn't have a sick sheep or his pig anywhere. And I said, Dad, I said, no chores. He said, no boys. I thought, oh, I'm smart. I know how to work. I, don't, I despise people that are lazy. I'm glad, I'll tell you this about Martha. She wasn't lazy. And the Bible says, whatsoever thou doest, do it heartily as unto the Lord. Whatever you do. Whatsoever you do and do in word and deed, he said, do it as unto the Lord. That ought to help you tomorrow when you go pump gas or whatever it is your job is. If you've been given that job by the Lord, do it for the Lord's sake. And Martha, she sure wasn't lazy. And she comes in and she says, uh, she says, Jesus, she's abandoned me and I'm in here slaving and laboring away. So he wasn't rebuking her for a servant. She probably could have said, well, what are we going to do as... What are you going to do, feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish? What are we going to do? Where are we going to get food? Somebody's got to get in here. Get her in there. Jesus said, no, I'm not, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to do that. Keep reading there in Mark chapter 14. It says they had indignation, said, why was this waste? Look, anything done on the Lord's not a waste. Anything you do for the Lord. The facilities here, if you are preaching the gospel here, and you're believing the book here and trying to follow the Lord here, every nickel you put in that offering plate is not a waste. It's given for, for an eternal purpose, an eternal plan. You singing a special, playing the piano, singing in the choir, is not a waste to God. It is to the devil. But, you know, I'm glad I've made some right choices. I look at some of my other family members, and I look at what they've done in life, and, man, some do pretty well financially, and I don't have one bit of regret about that. I'd rather have my kids, if you came to me and said, I'll tell you what, if you would, I'll give you a million dollars. I'll give you $10 billion if one of your kids wouldn't serve the Lord and say, keep your trash. Man, I, more than anything in my life, I pray that my kids, and now I'm praying for my grandkids. And I, again, I'm not bragging. I don't know. I, boy, I pray to God they get saved. But I don't want to just get saved. I don't want to survive. I want them to succeed. I want to be in good churches. I want their marriages to be strong. Amen. I want them to love the Lord and love each other and not waste their life. And they said, well, this is a tragedy, a waste of the ointment. It might have been sold for 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, let her alone. Why you trouble you? She hath wrought a good work on me, for you have the poor with you always. And whensoever you may do them good. But me have not always. She had done what she could. Oh, what a statement. She had done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. She has come uh, beforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. She knew. She knew. In fact, John says, against the day of my bearing, she's kept this up. She'd been saving a year and a half wages. I remember one preacher saying he thought what she was saving up was kind of her dowry. I don't know. I, I, I don't know where he got that. But I'll tell you this. She'd been saving up for a long She caught it. And she'd been saving up for about a year and a half. When Jesus would say that, she thought, i got to get ready. Because he said, we're only going to have three days. We're not going to have time. He, that's what she, it says. It says she did this ahead of time. Against the day of my burying. She knew he was going to die. She knew he'd be buried. She knew it would be a fast burial and a fast resurrection. And they wouldn't have time to get the job done. So she said, I'm going to do it early. And she started stockpiling her, her wealth. And they were poor people. They were poor people. And she'd been putting this together against, he said in John, against the day of my bearing, she put this all together. And look what it says there in verse number 10. And Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went out to the chief priest to betray him. He said, that's it. You're going to embarrass me? You embarrass me, Jesus? I'm going to go out. We'll see who's boss. Do people in churches do such things? I've been in some pretty big church battles. I mean, some big ones. I remember one, I was telling my wife, again, you, I can laugh about it now. And I went, went through a church battle before we started our church. And, and one of the criticisms against me was that I used the Bible to answer every question. What a terrible thing for a preacher to do. <laughs> Plumber using a wrench when he comes to work. 
The guy stood up and said, well, he, yes, he uses the verse every time you, you ask him a question. And I started to try to explain something, and I couldn't help it. I said a verse, and he said, there he goes again. <laughs> it's funny now, but boy, when your life's turned upside down, it ain't so funny when you're going through troubled times. But I know I, know I think I made, the, I made the right choice. In fact, that's why we even started our church. I said, God... If I, may, if I did you wrong and I shamed you, go ahead and just shut this thing down, smash me. I said, but if I did the right thing and followed your word, I said, I ask you to do one thing, just honor your word. That's all I ask. Just honor your word. I think I made the right choice. I think if you're in church tonight, I think you're making the right choice. I think if you yield to the Holy Spirit tonight, I think you're making the right choice. I think Judas made the wrong choice. You know why they made the wrong choice? Because he's bitter. Look real quick, and I'll wrap, try to wrap it up here. Look at John 11. Look at it. Here's, here's, remember Paul Harvey? And now you know the rest of the story. John 11 and 12 tells how it all come out for all three. I said, here's Martha. She's in chapter 12, but look at chapter 11. Now, a certain man, and I'll just read quickly here, was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, same town, the town of Mary and Martha. It was Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. His brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. See, Jesus loved this family. Look at verse 5. Now, Jesus loved Martha. He loved her. He loved Mary. He loved Martha. He loved Lazarus. They all knew it. He's really sick. He's got COVID or something. He's sick nigh unto death. Quick. Get Jesus. Tell him the one that he loves. I'm throwing that in. Don't you forget to put that part in. You know he loves him. And the Bible says he was a friend. See, I really believe you're choosing how you want, to, you want to go to heaven. You know, Psalm says, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. What time I'm afraid, I'll trust in thee. Isaiah said, I'll trust in thee and not be afraid. I heard a preacher say, That's... Either you're going to go to heaven first class or economy. What, how are you going to go? You can fear and worry and fret and be cumbered about with much serving and be all stirred up and shook up and terrorized and all the rest and say, I'm going to trust God, or you can trust God and not be afraid. Now, I'm not bragging. I might have told you this here. In 2016, I had a heart attack. I was over in Jordan doing an archaeological dig. I had a heart attack for literally a month, and I didn't want to go into the hospital there. So I was taking... I was taking uh, Pepsi and aspirin, you know, just trying to get through the thing. And it was a hard dig, and I come back, and man, it hit me hard. And uh, they had to go in and take me. And I'm this kind of typical guy, and I didn't want to believe them. And so I, the nurse kind of got that, and finally she's sitting across me. She said, look, you had a heart attack. Okay, I said, I needed to hear that. Because I didn't want to believe them. I wasn't, I, and I'm not bragging on this. Because I don't want to brag, because... Because that opens you up to the devil. When I actually go and die, I might have a tough time. I might be afraid. I pray I won't. But I know this. After I was in rehab, not alcohol rehab. I guess that's what most... I heard people say, hey, you better qualify what rehab you were in. It was for my heart, okay? And we were sitting there with a bunch of other patients that had heart attacks. We, you know, we kind of got to know one another a little bit. And one of the ladies, the lights were kind of dark. We were waiting for the nurse to come in. And I heard her say, I'm so scared I'm afraid to sleep at night. And I thought, Oh, man, I'd need to witness that lady. And the next thing I thought was, praise God, that never even entered my head. I thought, hallelujah, at least that time, it's never, I never was thinking, oh, man, I may die and go home to be with Jesus. Oh, no. I, didn't, I wasn't afraid. Now, maybe the next go around, <laughs> I may do opposite of Peter, but thank God I know one time, it didn't even enter my head to be afraid. Thank God for it. I knew to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. Notice she began to command Jesus, and then I'll just kind of wrap it up. It says there in John 11, though, I want you to see this. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister Mary, and you know that he, he waited two more days. And it, Oh, it's so funny. Look at verse 11. Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that he may awake. Then the disciples, Lord, if he sleep, how shall he do well? Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, they thought he had spoken. Then Jesus said plainly, Lazarus is dead. He said, uh, our friend Lazarus, he's asleep. Well, that's good, isn't it, Jesus? He said, if he's asleep, then he'll get his strength back. Look, guy, he's dead, okay? Dead, D-E-A-D, dead. 
I mean, there's so much good stuff in the Bible. Uh, people say the Bible's boring. I tell our folks, the reason you say that is because you're boring. Yeah. <laughs> Bible's not boring. You're just trying to turn it into a TV show or a sitcom or some stupid book that you read. It is the mind of Christ. Yeah. Keep reading there. And Jesus said plainly, Lazarus is dead. I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that she may go, that she may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then saith Thomas, here's down, which is Didymus said to his fellows, let us also go that we may die with him. See, again, we, we pegged these people, but at least he said that. Because they, they said, well, if he's going to go die, let's all go. I'll lead the way. We'll all go and die with him. <laughs> Keep reading there. Then Jesus came. He found he'd lay in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs. And many of the Jews, look at this, came to Mary. This is critical. To Mar Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning the brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. Look at this. But Mary sat still in the house. Ooh. Then, Martha said, and then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, she's going to rebuke him a little bit. If thou hast been here, my brother had not died. God, you had your chance. You blew it. We sent you in plenty of time. I don't know what in the world you're doing, but you're dinking around. Now my brother's dead. It's too late. If you'd have been here, my brother had not died. But, now, but then she throws this in. But I know, look at this. It's It's hilarious. It's sad, it'd, be, it'd really be funny if it wasn't sad because she never changed. She never changed. And there's probably people here tonight, you're saved, but you're going to hang on to your bitterness and you're going to hang on to your fear. Had a lady in our church that had a kid with, not uh, autism, right? And they come out of back, back, rough background. They got saved. God was healing that kid. I kid you not. And I told our church folks one time, I said, I believe God's going to heal that kid completely. And he was on the move, but mama got mad. And that boy now is kind of reverted back into all of that, and they're back on drugs all the time. And she's controlling him like a puppy dog. And that's how some people, that's how you got, you got your little pet troubles, and you're going to keep them. You bring them out once in a while, and you pet on them, and they're your little favorite thing. Instead of just letting loose and letting God, you're... Yeah, but you don't understand, preacher. Well, I don't need to understand. God understands. No, but you don't understand what I've been through. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what the preacher's been through or his wife. You don't know. God, God knows. It says in verse number 21, Martha said, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother not died. Look at this. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give thee. Look at this. Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know. My oldest son, he's a great guy. He's a great kid. When he was little, he was the greatest kid to, I've ever seen to raise. He was the greatest older brother. My older brother's beat on me. He was a great older brother. And I remember telling him something, and he'd say, I, he's just a little bitty kid. He's a great big boy now, bigger than me. Both my boys are bigger than me. And my oldest son, he, when he was little, he'd say, I know, Daddy, I know. So sometimes now, even as a grown man, he'll say something, I'll say, I don't think that, or whatever. We talk a lot about spiritual things. He'll say, I know, Daddy, I know. Well, he didn't know. <laughs> I know. She, you know what? Look at it. I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. She said, Jesus, that's not what I'm talking about. I want him raised now. Yeah, I know, I know all the religious, the jargon. He'll rise again. Look what he said. I am the resurrection of life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Now, folks, again, Jesus didn't explain this. See, when somebody dies and they're put in a casket, that's not, that's just a, that's the first death. That's just the shadow. Death is not annihilation. It is separation. Get that out of your head. Death is not annihilation. When somebody dies physically, they don't pass off the scene. They're somewhere. And in hell, the rich man lifted up his eyes. And Lazarus was carried, uh, the, uh, the, the beggar was carried to Abraham's bosom. That's just the shadow of the second death, the real one. You and I will never experience that. Isn't that cool? You'll never experience the eternal death. Oh, we'll walk through that valley of the shadow. Mm. 
I can see my shadow here. And you'll be walking along, and there it is, the shadow of death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Amen. Thy rod and thy staff. You know what you do with rods and staff with sheep? You clunk them on the head. I see Jesus pulling his staff out and say, devil, get away. I'm going to clunk you on the head if you get any closer. <laughs> he said, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Amen. You may see the shadow of my hand. You may see the shadow of death, but it'll never lay a hand on you. He said, do you, listen, he asked her a question. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Then listen to this. He said, believest thou this? She didn't answer him. She said to him, Yea, Lord, I believe thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come in the world. He didn't ask her that. Yeah, yeah, I believe everything, yeah, all this stuff you've been saying. Right. Look, keep reading. And when she had so said, she went her way. Now, that's kind of telling. Look at this. And called Mary, her sister, secretly. Why do you think she did that? I'm President Biden whispering. <laughs> Mary. Yeah. Mary. Notice what she said. The master. Thy speech berayeth you many times in a church fight. You know, people get upset. You know what they'll never do? They'll never call me pastor. You know why? Because it says, even to use the phrase, pastor, you're acknowledging that person's over you. you say, I don't believe it. Then you ain't been in a church fight. Look what she called him at the beginning, verse 21. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord. Well, she's trying to get God to play her game. She pulls the Jesus card. Actually, in a way, this was quite a compliment. She knew that Mary wasn't going to do what she said. Unless Jesus told her. That's a compliment to Mary. Bitter that she get back in here and that, and that the John, uh, Luke 11, and here she comes, comes to Jesus and said, Lord, here's what I want you to do. And he wouldn't do it. So she goes to Mary and said, the master. So what's the big deal? Jesus said, you call me master and Lord. He said, you say well, for so I am. Why do he say that? Master and Lord. You know, it's interesting in the Bible, phrases are so critical. I love it when they say in the Old Testament, the Lord thy God, or the Lord my, I love it when they say the Lord my God. But I'll tell you what, I'm always a little edgy in those stories when they say the Lord thy God. Something's wrong with that person. When they say the Lord my God, like I like Nebuchadnezzar, he said, now I extol the most high God. He is the God of heaven and earth. He said, he's my God now. You know, Judas, you know that. Judas never called Jesus Lord. When he said, one of you betray me, it says all 12 of them said, Lord, is it I? 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 They come to Judas, master, is it I? You know what the devil won't do? He don't want to call Jesus Lord. Well, someday, isn't it going to be exciting? When every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth shall bow their knee and confess that Jesus Christ is what? I told my wife today, I'm collecting all the verses on bowing the knee. There is something to an invitation. There is something to an altar. There is something. you falling on your face. You heard it in Sunday school. There is something to Jairus falling on his face in front of Jesus. There is something to the woman with the issue of blood, blood falling on her face in front of Jesus. In fact, when Jesus Christ prayed in the garden, it said he kneeling down prayed. And you won't have the courage to stand out and walk down an altar for five years. You've got to be kidding me. You're telling me you heard that many messages and God's never spoke to you enough? Well, you'd bow the knee. Amen. Yep. The Bible says, oh, come, let us bow down. Let us worship before our God. Yep. Say, so, well, it's not that important. The devil thought it was. He said, I'll give you all of this if you'll do one thing. If you'll fall down, you'll kneel down in front of me. There is something to it. There's something big to it. She's rebuking Jesus here. She goes to Mary, and she says, the master. You think that she felt a little guilty? 
You know what she's trying to do? She's trying to drag Mary into her sin. That's what she's doing. Mary's where she's supposed to be. She's waiting on Jesus, trusting Jesus. She goes in and said, Master, he's calling you. He didn't call her. Where do you read that? He called her. Keep reading. It says, and as soon as she heard that, she rose quickly and came to him. Look at, now Jesus was not yet coming to town, but was in that place where Martha met him. He didn't move from that spot. What spot? Where Martha went her way. He said, I ain't going no farther. Some of you, by choice, are going to plateau in your Christian life. You don't have to. Say, you don't understand, man, what I've done. Paul was a serial killer. David murdered people. Moses murdered a man. David was an, uh, an adulterer. Abraham had a problem. He lied. His wife had a problem. She was a liar. They had a son, Isaac. You know what his problem was? He was a liar. He had a wife, Rebecca. You know what his problem was? She was a liar. They had a son named Jacob. You know what his problem was? He was a liar. <laughs> they all had problems. Gideon's dad had the immoral worship out in the backyard. Abraham's dad was an idolater. And what's your problem again? He says he stopped right where Martha was. And the Jews which went with the house, they comforted her. They saw Mary, and she rose hastily, went out and followed her. She go to the grave. To, man, everybody's totally messed up. <laughs> they're, they're all confused. Oh, there's Miss Mary. Oh, well, she's running to the grave. She's probably going to throw herself on the tomb. We better go out there and grab her. Then Mary was coming where Jesus was and saw him. She fell down at his feet saying, Lord, if thou... Now she's repeating what her sister. And I see people do that when they get out of sorts with God. I like the phrase... The black sheep like it when the white sheep get a little dirty because it makes them feel more comfortable. When you get out of sorts with God, you try to drag everybody down you can so it makes you not look so bad. Now, the preacher didn't say, I, am I, I don't know if I'm hitting on anything or not here. <laughs> but the reason I'm doing it is because I, I know we're all the same. The names and faces change, but the guilty are the same. Huh? I'm just kidding. Churches are churches. People are people. Keep reading. When Mary has come, she fell down. Verse number 33, Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews all, look at this, also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Now he's troubled. You know what the word troubled there means? Agitated. He's angry. He's angry at what's going on. It's getting worse. It's, get, it's chaos. He groaned. That means indignation. Like a horse, I grew up with horses, and when they get angry, sometimes they'll snort. They're mad. They're about ready to do something. Like a bull. I can read cattle. I can read cattle. I can see, I'll say, I'll say, man, my son-in-law, he's, he's better now as a better rancher than I, but he grew up uh, more in the city, and he's got cattle and horses, chicken, dogs, and everything like that. But I tell him, say, that cow is getting ready to charge you. That bull is going to take you in about five seconds. You just see it on men. They're getting ready to take you. They're going to run you over. They're thinking about it. They're going to, and Jesus, the Bible says, he groaned. And his spirit, and he was troubled. He said, where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. And the Jews said, and they're, they're, they're off. Behold how he loved him. And they said, could not this man, which opened the eyes, they're off. Oh, Jesus messed up. We're with Mary. We're with Martha. Jesus, could he not have done a miracle and kept this guy alive? Could he not have helped this guy and opened the eyes of blind cause him that even this man should not have died? What did Jesus say about it? He therefore again groaning in himself said, oh, I think he went like, oh, man. Where's the grave? <laughs> it's over there. Lazarus, come on, come forth. Now just wrap it up. Martha messed her whole testimony up. Look at verse 54 or 45. Many of the Jews which came to Mary had seen the things which Jesus did. They believed on him. That didn't, Martha didn't have any sway with anybody. They probably after a while got to thinking, you know, I saw her rebuking Jesus. Jesus is God. And he knew exactly what he was doing because Lazarus came alive. Man, Mary doesn't know Jesus at all. Or Martha, they could have said, Martha doesn't know Jesus at all. Now, Mary, see, if you look in your Bible, when Jesus was facing Calvary, everybody's running around like chickens with their head cut off. Disciples over here cussing here, 
they're running here, they're hiding here, they're, they're afraid over here. The women, they're crying, where'd you take his body? And they, they, we, got, we got to hurry and get Jesus anointed. You know what, this Mary right here, she's nowhere to be found. Where was she at? I have a sneaking suspicion. She probably was where she'd always been, sitting there waiting on Jesus. This Mary was not with that crowd of other women. She's waiting. Well, I said three days. I cannot wait for Sunday. And boy, I'll tell you what. I think we're heading in a day where people are going to be running around. Christians are running around. People are confused and worried. You never read on the tombstone, this person's dead because of worry. But I'll tell you what. Most people probably could have something like that on there. Because worrying and fretting causes distress and suffering and ulcers and anguish and grief and headache and torment and all kinds of things. I told my wife this. I'll be done. I promise you. This, I'm not lying to you now. <laughs> you might have heard this. I think David Gibbs, he preached here, hasn't he? David Gibbs. He tells his story. There was a, back in the days of slavery... I've read about him. He actually, he's, today, there was a kid. Some said he was a slave. Others I've read on said his dad was a slave and his mom was free, but he was born into that slavery situation. And David Gibbs tells that his mom was beat. They were owned, they were owned by a terrible uh, taskmaster, literally beat his mom to death. Well, and he held his mom as a nine, I believe it was a nine-year-old boy. He held his mom while she breathed out her last breath. And while she was dying, she said, Charlie, one thing, don't ever turn your back on the Lord Jesus. David Gibbs tells how the master was so angry at that boy, he beat him. He said, you'll never have a day off. He said, by the time he was a young man, he was covered with scars from the top of his head to the sole of his foot. He never got a day off. I, I read on him not too long ago. But when he got to be a teenager, that's when the slaves were set free. And he wanted to be educated. So he'd work, he'd work 14 hours a day, six days a week still, even when he was free. But then at night, he would run 10 miles barefoot to a school where they'd teach him how to read. The kid was smart. He picked up Greek. He picked up Hebrew. He started to learn how to read. He got saved. One day, he felt called to preach. They had him preach a little bit when he was a young man. He said, one day I was called to Philadelphia to start a church. He said, you can't start. Philadelphia, that's where those educated people are. You can't, you can't be doing that. Your background. He went and took a church, and they said in one year, the building, they packed out 5,000 people. And they said in one year, that was only half of the church attender, the church members, I should say, black and, and white. This guy wrote songs. They called him the father of gospel music. In fact, the whole song, We Shall Overcome, came from a phrase, he, he, a song he had wrote. Did great things for the Lord. Some of the songs you might remember, Stand By Me, or Take Your Burden to the Lord and Leave It There. Instead of that guy being bitter and angry against God, Amen. against humans, he got saved. And thousands of people got saved because of him. Again, the sad thing is with Martha, I don't see her ever changing. Came to pass, they're in Bethany, Martha served. I don't, I don't think Joseph's brothers ever really changed. Did they go to heaven? Yeah. But after 17 years of jo Joseph caring for them, feeding them, when dad died, they said, he's been lying all along. We knew it. He's a little hypocrite. The other shoe's going to drop. Dad's dead. He's going to kill us now. And they wrote a fake letter saying, Dad said, right, here's a letter from Dad. Dad says, forgive your elder brothers. <laughs> and you know what it says when Joseph read it? You know what he did? He wept. I think one of the reasons he wept is he knew his brothers hadn't changed a bit. Hadn't learned anything. He said, I'm going to care for you, and I'm going to care for your little ones. He said, God did this. You meant it for evil. Man alive, you've had bad things happen to you. That doesn't mean when you forgive that, that, that God's not going to judge that person. He said, you, what you did was evil. Listen to this. He said, but God meant it for good. You know what that word mean, me, meant? He meant it for good. It means to twine it. 
You ladies, you braid your hair. You take a little bit here and there and you do this. Somehow Joseph figured that out. He said, God meant it. He twined this whole thing. I always say, why didn't God just rain up there? Why couldn't he said, God, you put me through a living hell for 13 years and I've gone from nothing but trouble in my life and all you'd had to do was just rain up there. God wanted to do it different. And he trusted the Lord. Remember Daniel? When Daniel knew the writing was, the decree was signed, he went to his own house, his windows being opened, he kneeled down on his knees and what? Gave thanks. For what? He's a eunuch, I believe. He's totally alone, no family. You wrecked my life, Nebuchadnezzar. You tortured me. I'll never have kids. I'm a child of the king. I could have been king of... There's a chance he could have been Josiah's son if you do their time in three months. He could have been a three-month-old child when Josiah passed off the scene. Just knowing how God works, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if he'd have been the future king of Israel, and he might have known it. He loved Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day towards Jerusalem, and God would never let him go back. When it came time to die, he said, thank you, God, for giving me a good life. Thank you for letting me know you. Thank you. I know where I'm headed. Heaven's my home. Thank you, God, for using me in my life. That choice is yours. It's a choice. That's the good part. Mary chose the good part. Let's stand to our feet and bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, I pray you'd help us. We're all making choices every day. We're going to make a lot of choices. I believe in these last days we're going to make a lot. There's a lot to choose. There's a lot of things to choose. There's these young people. They can choose to do and have and see and experience anything like no other age. I pray, God, these young men, these young ladies, young parents here tonight will say, I'm going to choose the good part. I'm going to invest my life. I'm going to invest my life in eternal things. I pray that men and ladies of this church will say, we're going to stick by the stuff. Doesn't matter. I don't care what the last days hold. Mary didn't let anything change her on that. Martha got her off a little bit, but there she is back trusting the Lord. She anointed his feet, said, I believe you. You're going to come up out of that grave. And I think she was sitting there waiting for three days. Said, he said it, and I believe it. And I pray, God, you'd help us tonight. If there's someone here tonight that's not sure they're saved, that they'd realize tonight that is where it all must start. They need to be saved. Come now and let us reason together. You invite them to be saved. And if there's someone here tonight that's not sure they're saved, I pray they'd come and take the, let someone take the Bible and show them how to be saved. And I pray, God, as that piano in a moment plays, that moms and dads and young people and, and men and women Lord, would choose the good part in these last days. I'm going to have the piano begin to play with our heads bowed and our eyes closed that the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to you tonight. He's doing it for a reason, Mary. He's doing it for a reason, Martha. He's trying to say something. He says to Martha, hey, do you believe? Oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard that a thousand times. I'm glad Mary didn't say that. I'm glad Mary trusted. You know what? It says that when it was all done and the word got out, if they wanted to find out about Jesus and this, this, this trust of the Lord, he could even raise the dead, guess who they went to? They went to Mary. She had the testimony. A testimony is a test. It's a test. That's why it's a testimony. And it means you go through the fire, you go through the test, and you come out on the other side victorious. Why do you think God told the seven churches, he that overcometh, whatsoever the Spirit saith, he saith to the churches. Those messages are for you and I. So those are just, those are stories in the Bible. Hey, you know what the Bible says? All these things that were done unto them were written for us and in sample unto us upon whom are come the ends of the world. God said, every one of those stories is for you and I today. And folks, if we're not in the last days, we're, we're getting mighty close. I think the Lord is probably reaching. I think he's standing at the door. He's probably ready to reach for that 
the doorknob and God's going to say, go get them. And what you and I are in these last days, what you and I get done, we had better be busy about our Father's business. I look up the latter part of the, I'm on the other side of the hill. I think, man, time's getting short. I think, man, what am I going to do for the Lord? I want to get busy. So, well, I've wasted my life. Well, I'll tell you, I'll remind you, Abraham was, he was 100 years old before he really learned the power of prayer. Haggai was 80 years old. And God called him into the ministry. Can God use you? Yeah, he can. Does he want to use Martha? He loved her. It's not that she was evil. It's just she didn't choose the best. I'm glad Mary did. And you and I can make that same choice. Amen. Thank you. Let me have your attention. Wasn't that good tonight? A lot of good thoughts in there. Choose the best part. Amen. Sitting at Jesus' feet. And I like what he said. Servant's good. There's nothing like sitting at Jesus' feet. And that's what motivates us, sir. Brother Wrights, you've helped us today. I appreciate you being here. Thank you for coming and being with us. That helps us just to continue on. Continue steadfastly in our faith. That's not just in serving, but also in the Apostles' Doctrine, Fellowship, Prayer, Breaking of Bread. All of it, we're supposed to be there and especially sitting at Jesus' feet. Well, I don't want to have that bitter spirit that Martha had and the criticizing spirit and all that. Yeah, man, that was good. That was good, good thoughts there tonight. Good to see you in church. Uh, today and uh, be praying for uh, all the activities this week things throughout the week going on at the church and uh, then pray for those that have been sick pray that God will raise them up but good to see you good crowd here tonight and uh, I know a lot of a lot of people are texting me throughout the day saying uh, they were sick or throughout the week rather and uh, so let's pray for them and then those that are traveling still God will bless them and to be faithful in your giving God loves a cheerful giver amen if you did not get one of the new bulletins they're back back there at uh, this just says they continued steadfastly. It's got a, a lot of announcements in here, things that are going on, ministries, and the birthday list is in there as well. And those are on the back back there. Be uh, Just be in prayer for all the activities going on at the church. In the bookstore, the Baptist Times are in, if you haven't picked those up. And then also uh, the, the devotional booklets, those are in there. Those are free if you get in there. First come, first serve, all right? So if you get in there and get them after that. Wrestle for them, do whatever you want, arm, arm wrestle, flip a coin, do whatever, but hope it's a blessing to you, and it's been good to be in church today. Let's, let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for what we've heard today. Lord, you've spoken to our hearts from your word, using your man. And Lord, thank you that we could uh, take some practical lessons home with us about sitting at your feet, and Lord, learning from you, and then having faith like we heard this morning, just to trust you. God, you've got it all figured out. We don't need to worry about it. Uh, just trust you. Lord, I pray you'd help us as a church collectively to keep serving you. Lord, we want to see folks saved and uh, come to know you as their Savior, lives changed. Lord, it's not our work, it's the work of the Holy Spirit, but you just want to use us. And I pray that you would use each one of us this week. Give us opportunities, open doors, and then give us the boldness we need to step through those open doors and take advantage of them for your honor and glory. We thank you for it. Dismiss us now with your blessings. Watch over us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you are dismissed.